Before we get to today's episode, a quick announcement about the upcoming 300th episode and your participation is encouraged. The 300th episode of the podcast is approaching really fast. I want to do a special celebratory episode and I want to include your voice in it. You've been hearing my voice week after week for six years, if you have been listening for that long or for any amount of time. But I would love to hear from you and include what you have to say about the podcast in the Celebratory 300 episode. I am excited about this milestone and I want to celebrate it with you, my dear listener. What I need from you is a simple, short and sweet audio message. Yes, it has to be an audio message and not a written text. You can record the audio message using your voice memo app, and then you can email that file to me or any other medium. You can send an audio message through Facebook Messenger. You can go to the contact page of my website, authenticparenting.com forward slash contact. And there is a special tool. It's called SpeakPipe. You can click to record your audio message and it directly comes to me. Or you can call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. So there you go. There are multiple ways for sending your audio. And if you don't know what to say, here is a simple script that you can use, but feel free to do your own. This is just a sample. You can say, hi, my name is Anna. I've been listening to the podcast for three years and I love the podcast. And you can mention the reasons. I am from New Jersey, United States, and I usually listen to your podcast when I'm walking or doing the dishes. You can also say when and how you discovered the podcast, because I would love to know that. And of course, I want to hear what you love about the podcast, your favorite guests, your favorite episodes. Even if you don't remember the exact number, the exact title, or the names of the guests, you can just mention what you took away from a specific episode. I think that would be enough. And I would love to know how the podcast has influenced your parenting, how it changed your worldview, your mindset or the biggest things that you've learned from the podcast. And of course, you can conclude by saying wishes for the podcast, encouraging words for me to continue bringing this content to you, and just wrapping up with a gratitude. I can't wait to receive some messages from you. Uh, Send them very quickly because we have to put this episode together. It takes time for my editor and my team to put it together. So if you want to participate, be sure to send your messages by November 19th. That's it for this short announcement. Again, get to it. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. Don't think that your voice doesn't sound good or you don't have much to say. I want to hear from you. Sending you love and gratitude always and forever. Looking forward to hearing from you. I am Anna Seewald and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection and joy in parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. I'm a parent educator and my mission is to help children by helping parents. The motto of this podcast is raising our children, growing ourselves. Today, 
Strategies for Digital Parenting. As a parent educator and parent myself, I know that technology use is a big contentious topic. Screen time. Parents are confused. The struggles are real. Many families are searching for answers. How much screen time is too much? Are screens good or bad? How can I get my kids off their devices without fights and explosive behaviors? Are screens addictive? And is my kid an addict already? What are the symptoms of too much screen time? How do I break my child's screen addiction? How much time should a child spend on screens? As a mom of a teen and a person living in 2021, I am not against technology and I don't think screens are inherently bad. Hey, we're using this wonderful medium to communicate together, right? I am all in favor of teaching kids responsibility, safety, and balance. Balance for me is the key word. The goal is finding balance between screen-based and non-screen-based activities. The goal isn't to eliminate screens from your life. It's to imbue the time you spend on screens with intentionality. How can we trust our kids, nurture good tech habits, teach them how to use the internet safely and let go of control? Yes, I said the C word. I am speaking today with Jessie Liu. She is a recent acquaintance of mine that I met online. She's the founder of Digital Parenting Coaching. In fact, she started this practice very recently during the pandemic. She's worked in cybersecurity for more than 14 years, shaping employees' internet habits in corporations. She's the mother of four children, and she herself faces the same issues that we all do. She says that we're living in the digital era, and hence we need new skills to digital parent our children. She helps parents to become confident digital parents, build better relationships with their children while empowering their children to use electronic devices in more responsible and safe ways. She's also an executive contributor of Brains Magazine. Executive contributors at Brains Magazine are handpicked and invited to contribute because of their knowledge and valuable insight within their area of expertise. In today's conversation, we talked about the internet safety risks for our kids, how to use technology in safe and positive ways, how to make family agreements about screen time based on your core values. This is something I advocate for, and I do have an agreement in my family as well. And how can you do this process with your kids? Yes, co-creating it with your children is the answer. Jesse calls this agreement internet safety agreements. And I just love that. It's not a contract. It's an internet safety agreement. And just because you made an agreement with your kids doesn't mean it's going to work automatically smoothly. It's a living document. And as your children grow, their needs change, the way they engage with technology changes, you need to update this living document. We need to adjust and readjust. And why education with the parent might be the first step. At the end of the day, you want to have trust with your children because parenting, after all, is a relationship. It's all about teaching kids how to be responsible, nurture positive tech habits, interact with technology safely, and have a balanced life. And hey, I didn't say it was easy. We have talked about screen time and digital parenting on the podcast before, and I wanted to suggest a few past episodes. 
Episode 244, Should You Worry About Your Kids' Screen Time? with Anya Kamenetz. Episode 284, How to Raise Kids Who Aren't A-Holes with Melinda Moyer. There is a segment in this episode that talks about digital parenting. Episode 161, How to Live Mindfully in a Digital Age with Nancy Collier. And episode 87, Why You're Addicted to Facebook and How to Defeat It. This is a solo episode where I talk about my own personal struggles with Facebook and screens in 2016. Yes, this is an old episode. And as a result of that experience, I created seven rules that I live by to this day. And maybe in the future, I will record a fresh episode about my own digital hygiene and how I engage with screens these days. And now, please enjoy this conversation with cybersecurity expert, digital parenting coach, and mom, Jessie Liu. Well, thanks for being here today, regardless of tech problems yesterday. Today, we have a good connection. It appears to be. (laughs) Zoom is still uh, operating. So... I wanted to invite you, Jesse, because a lot of parents are worried about screen time, how much screen time their children use, are they getting addicted, what's going on, they have troubles controlling their children's screen time, screen time gets in the way of their relationship, people lose connection with their kids. Of course, it depends on the age of the child, but it can really get nasty in a lot of households. People fight over screens, parents and children. So I wanted to invite you, since you are a mother of four and you specialize in cybersecurity, but now you are doing this digital parent coaching, I wanted you to give us some information, tools for having a balanced life, Uh, nurturing good, positive habits in our children and relinquish control, build trust. And I know you have a lot to say about this. So this resonates with me. I am not against screens. Not all screens are evil and not everything our children do on screens is dangerous or, or unsafe or harmful. But I want you to tell us why you got into this area of digital parenting. How did you get into it? And then we'll get from there. Okay, thanks, Anna, for inviting me here. I'm so blessed and happy and excited to be here to share my tools and my techniques in digital parenting with all the audience. So basically, I started in <laughs> during the pandemic, you know, because um, as a cybersecurity expert, um, definitely, you know, when you know so much about out there, you know, the, the online predators, you know, and, you know, the dark web and what are things available out there, I guess that you, when you know so much about out there, you are even more concerned. So I was always very concerned when I see that very young children have unlimited access to the phone and the parents is actually not really concerned actually checking what are they actually doing. And some children are just left with the device all day long without the parents' supervision. So I was actually trying to delay in the beginning, but they have access to the internet, but in a more controlled manner. But you know what? When during the pandemic hits, the school was closed down. All the children has to pivot to online classroom. And, you know, when we go to online classroom, you know, you can't run away from the device. They need the device to continue their learning journey. So it's actually let me really think about, okay, so how do I actually set in a way that I don't want them to be addicted? Because I can actually see from some of my peers or my friends uh, some of the children are really addicted to the phone. And uh, I'm also about concerned about like, you know, the internet dangers out there. And at the same time, I don't want to be controlling so much that I, I feel that I have to be there all the time because I, I don't feel that it's also the right way. And therefore, I actually come up with my ways to digital parenting my children. 
And coincidentally, uh, one of my friends actually we spoke, you know, during the pandemic, it just have a catch up. And then she actually told me that, you know what, I have to fight physically with my teenager son to get the smartphone. Then I was like, so shocked, what? You fight with him physically? Yes. Then I was asking, why are you actually fighting with him with over the phone? Then he was actually sharing that, you know, the son was very addicted to the phone. It's always the phone from all day and he can't stop it because in a way, he needs the phone to continue the online journey, you know, to go classroom, Zoom, you name it. And that's where that she realized that she's also like struggling in digital parenting the children. And that's where I started to think, well, this is something that I can offer. And then I started to engage and research about, you know, the pains and the things that people actually go through. And that's how I actually started. Yeah, you recently, so you're very new and just like anything in tech, you grew very fast. <laughs> you, you, you know, you started last year and here you are, you know, that that's pretty impressive because this is something a lot of parents won't need. And I follow you on Facebook and you recently posted something. I helped this mom with his son who was on the screens for all day going into two hours per day. People want that kind of transformation, right? Not everybody is on their phones or on their screens all day long. Some parents have somewhat of a balance. I think I have somewhat decent rules and trust and um, good habits have instilled in my daughter. I think we're in a good place now. And that doesn't mean that I haven't struggled or I don't still struggle with screen time, but I help other parents in, in this area as well. And I know that this is a big topic. A lot of parents are confused. How much is too much? That they're, they worry that their children are going to turn into violent monsters, killers. They are addicted to those video games. What's their future going to be? You name it. Uh, I hear all sorts of things. And you're right. During the pandemic, it was excessive for all of us, including myself. I guess everybody can join. Everybody was binging. We had nothing to do. It was extreme, extraordinary times. But now that we are, sort of in a different routine. We have different, somewhat normalcy in our lives. This is a good time to talk about this and reestablish rules and, and screen time engagement. So what are the dangers or what are the fears that a lot of parents have? And are these fears founded in reality? Recently, you wrote an article, right, for Brains Magazine. I, I read that. Can you mention some of those fears that parents have? Yes, yes. I think the most, the top fear of the, you know, parents actually really come to me is, the one is obviously the screen addiction. They always find the struggles, you know, establish the screen time. And it's also a power struggles between the parent and children. Because whenever the parents say, no, enough. Take back the screen time. Give me back your iPad. Give me back your smartphone. And that's where the power struggles and the conflict actually becomes. And, and that's where, you know, uh, most of the parents actually, you know, reveal that they feel at that particular time, they feel suddenly I become the monster mom, <laughs> monster dad. <laughs> and they have to really fight with the children all the time, most of the time because of the screen time. So and, that's the and like you mentioned, sometimes it gets physical and I'm happy that you're mentioning it because a lot of people feel bad and ashamed that it can get that ugly in their households. Some of my clients have seen me videos of them fighting with their children around this topic and it can really get ugly. So if somebody is listening and has struggled with this on that level, you're not alone. That this is somewhat of a common problem in many households. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I think um, my friend is one of the person who reveals. And there are some other parents who actually came into, uh, you know, and have uh, hope in the one-to-one -one coaching with me. And they also reveal the same. You know, some of them, they also have the physical fight. And sometimes there are names callings. And, you know, the, the children become very uh, not respectful. They will call their mom, like, you're a monster, you're... 
you know, there were, you know, and it can be really get ugly as what you actually said, you know. So, and that's where that is actually said that, you know, I, I feel that, I personally feel that, you know, technologies should actually allow us to connect more because look at now, you know, if let's say you are my friends and you are actually far away from me, the only way I can communicate with you is through Zoom, right? So it's actually a way for us to actually connecting more instead of less. But it seems that the tech has actually make people connect less. People are not present. They are just on the phone all the time. And not to say that would even children and sometimes even parents, because when they are with the phone, they may not be present with the children and the children didn't get the attention. And it's also a very not so good role model. And that's why they also model this is the behavior, right? So, and, and back to the internet dangers, you know, like there are also a lot of other internet dangers, like, you know, because some of the parents actually come to my channel and we have a call. One of it is like the, the negative influence on their behavior. So, you know, many of the times, right, when they're actually exposed to many contents, you know, the contents that they watch will actually start to change and manipulate the mindset. And they actually start to, to behave a bit strangely and sometimes a bit strangely. And sometimes the parents actually even say that I couldn't even recognize that as my child, right? So I guess that is actually even more than major because we are actually looking at future generations who are actually being manipulated by the outside social norms, which may not be good. You know, some of it could be like, as you said, too much of violence. And the more you expose to so much of violence of content, you actually normalize the behavior and you will feel that this is a normal behavior, right? So I think that's the second. And also that, you know, um, it's also about like the online predators and cyberbullying. Right now, do you know how many online predators are active daily on the internet? You know, really swimming and looking for their victims? Please scare actually, us with the number, yes. <laughs> It's actually 500,000 every day. There's online predators just be active on either social media, the games, waiting to hope for the next victim, which is our children. You know, and our children are not educated to handle all this. You know, so and one of the reasons why I actually come into this is I saw that there's a video called Kaylee Haywood Love Story. Kaylee Haywood love story. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. It's actually a story about a 15-year-old girl from Lechester. And she was actually online groomed by this guy called Look Hello. And the conversations is only take about 12 days. So you can actually see in just 12 days, a stranger can actually online groom a 15-year-old girl and convince that I'm your true love. Come, come out and meet up with me, right? And guess what? The girl actually lied to his mom and said that I'm, I'm going to meet my friend and she go and meet this guy. And at the end, she was killed and murdered in November 2015. And actually, the Chester Police Department asked permissions from the parents to record, you know, this story. They obviously get the actors to, you know, do the stories and they actually give it as a fairness to all parents, you know. So, you know, don't think that it's not my children, you know, because we will know. You know, any children could be a victim. And sometimes, you know, children couldn't protect themselves from things that they do not understand. If they do not know there's internet dangers out there, they do not know the in online predators out there, how can they protect themselves, right? So I think that, you know, education on internet safety is very, very important, you know? And is that where you start with parents? Usually we start with the screen addictions because that's the main concern they have. But obviously, they also got uh, the, the, the education on internet safety. Then I'll actually give them a quick hack on how to, about internet safety, what you should do, what you cannot do, what are the things that you should, you should actually configure on, on the device and, you know, go back to the internet safety fundamentals, allowing the parents to realize that, oh, this is safe and this is not safe. And why is that so? And they're also able to educate the children. Yes, yes. So at what age do you educate the children about those kind of things? How early, well, can, you, how early can you start? And what's that conversation like? Because I don't want to, um, if I'm a parent of a young child, 
I don't want to also scare my child too much, right? It, it can go the opposite way. You yourself have four children. What are their ages? Okay, so my uh, eldest is 11 years old, eight years old, and my twins is five years old. So I have a pair of twins and both of them are five years old. Yeah, so what would be a good age to start internet safety conversations? Is it when the child has their own device or is it when a child is using internet already, YouTube videos, right? Like I'm assuming your 11 year old engages with the internet differently than your five year olds, correct? Yes, yes, definitely. So basically, um, I would say that it's good to start when they are very young, you know, as long as you give them the device and depends on what other device you give them. So I have this client, she, I think her youngest is actually also like five years old, same like mine. So what I do is usually we start with a family values, right? And then and sometimes we discuss about the content. And obviously for my younger twins, because they are youngest, so they don't have access like, you know, the siblings, which is elder and they don't, you know. So uh, what they have is they have access to a YouTube keys, which is in a TV console. Number one is actually not so addictive because when you actually can bring the device like the smartphone, it can be get very addictive as well. So what we do is we actually educate about the uh, family values. But obviously for five years old, you have to speak things like very, in a very layman so they understand, right? So for YouTube kids, obviously there will be no online predators out there. So usually what we discuss is about the content. Is it nice? Is it kind, right? So you can actually start, you know, about, about the content, you know, and if let's say the content is actually very violent and actually pretty scared about them, do you want to continue to watch, right? So it's actually point back, you know, to the family values that you have, like it be it kind, responsible or do the right thing, you know, integrity, right? So we will always talk about the family values and tie to the technology use. So for five years old, obviously it's not much, but I think as long as they are at seven years old and they start to have like starting their school and they have some access to the devices, it's actually good to start the conversation. I, I see. Do children as young as five or six or seven also get quote unquote addicted to devices. I know that some some families, like you said, they just hand the device to the kids and they're always on the devices. So is that considered addiction? Or if you take the device away from that child in a week or three or a month or whatever the amount of time I want to know, that child will reset their usage habits or that becomes an addiction. When does this term addiction become a concern for parents? Well, for me, I think it comes to the addictions that they, when they rely so much, they can't live without it. For example, you know, like I must have this so that I can actually move with my life. You know, they feel boring and they feel that it's a reliance of their lives on the device. Then I will say that it's actually come to the point that it's a really addiction. But if let's say they, you know, if let's say you ask him to go out like, okay, let's go to the park and they are able to, you know, put down the device and they are willing to go to the park. I would say that maybe it's not so much about, you know, the addiction. It could be distraction because all these, you know, all these uh, smartphone and the apps are actually habit forming devices, you know, and, you know, even not to say children, even adults, sometimes when you actually scroll down the Facebook or the YouTube, you will realize that you suddenly you just spend like, wow, I already spent two hours. Wow, I already spent three hours without I noticing it, you know? And by the time, wow, it's so late. I didn't notice. I just thought that I just watched for a few videos, right? So I would say that it will be uh, more to like a distraction. But at the same time, if let's say you allow this behavior to continue like many years, then you will just become their habit and the reliance on that particular device is high. And that's where you realize that it's hard to break the addiction. Yes. Thanks for that clarification. Yes. So how can parents instill trust, build trust, and not inflict control, but nurture good habits in their children? I know this, this is a tall order, right? 
because many parents think that they have to get in there and they have to control every move their child makes that they they feel very out of control when they give a device I think I see extremes in in our culture. I'm not sure about you. They either give, either give a device to their kid that doesn't come with a lot of responsibility, and therefore the child gets lost in this in this world of content, and they don't know how to navigate because nobody taught them the safety, the rules, right? The put structure, rules of engagement, or any agreements in the household. I, I think parents sort of trust that their children are quote unquote mature enough because everybody else has a phone or a device. And I see the opposite parents giving their children devices, but controlling every moment, every aspect of it. And it's hell for children. I rarely see like a balanced approach. So how can we have structure, have agreements with our kids, but also trust our children and educate them that so that when there is something unsafe or bullying, some kind of red flag, they will come and talk to us or reach out to someone else, uh, know what to do. But we also give them privacy and don't monitor or spy on everything that they do because those devices allow us to spy on them, right? Uh, you can put uh, apps and things of that nature, but I don't think that's the right way either. What are your thoughts? Yes, I think uh, you're right. Most of the time, I think that there's uh, like, like you say, you know, there are two extremes. Mm -hmm. One would be like, just pass the device, you know, think that, you know, the children were able to navigate the internet on their own safely and they know how to make good decisions. But in reality, it's not because, you know, the children are drawn into the internet dangers and, you know, the content out there. But at the same time, I, we also have like a bunch of parents that are very concerned and they have to be there all the time. You know, they have to be there all the time, checking what you're doing, what you are doing. And to be honest, I think it's also very exhausting. And I do have some parents actually come to me because I think they have actually come to the point that, wow, in that case, I can't just do anything. I just have to be there all the time, right? So it's actually very exhausting for the parents as well. And at the end of the day, we want to establish the trust. And why the trust? Because you have to understand that at the end, I think there is so much things that we can control, you know, but when it comes to internet, a lot of things are beyond my control. Like, you know, there are thousands of people releasing new content every day. Today, you know, one of the top social media could be Facebook. But, you know, five years down the road, could be another new social media. We don't know which one, right? So there are new apps keep coming up, right? And also that, you know, we also can't control as in who are actually using the internet because there are so many people are using the internet, right? So we have to train our use, you know, our children to be the users and able to navigate the danger at the same time. That's why I think the discussion and education on online safety is very important. And we also have to teach them how to make good decisions. And when you need to teach them how to make good decisions, and you know, from the conversations, if you have the family meeting with them, I can say that from most of the time, they can actually answer you know, things that you feel that they are making good decisions. I think automatically the trust is already there. And if let's say, you know, if let's say sometimes they do really make stupid mistakes, maybe they, they know this is not right, but they still do it, you know. And they can actually come to you and admit, mom, you know what? I have to do this. I know it's not supposed, but you know what? I just thought that, yeah, maybe it's all right, you know? So it's also about the safe space that allowing our children to tell us that, you know, I've actually made a mistake, you know? So what's, up, what's going on? And it's about the, the space that you create for them that you have to trust at the same time to have the privacy. At the same time, it's actually safe for them to tell you what is going on in their life. Could be on their online world. Could be even their offline world, you know. Maybe something happens, bad happens in the school. And they need to just have the courage to tell you what happened, right? So when you come to the how to make good decisions, I always use back the family values because it's very straightforward. You know, like, like for example, you know, your family promotes responsibility because 
my family values is responsibility, right? So what are your responsibility as, as, a, as a student? Because they also have to understand what are the roles they are playing. They are also a student. And if let's say they take extra class like piano class, you know, <coughs> it also needs commitment. Otherwise, it's better not to do it, you know. So, and they also have a role to play in the family, to contribute to the family. So when they realize that these are the responsibility that they need, they already establish a priority things that they need to complete first before the screen time. You know, other, other than the, the online school, which is the top priority as well. But if it's more on the entertainment, it's really they understand that they have to complete the most things in their plate, which is the priorities, before move to the, to the screen time. And I felt that the more we give the powers to the children to allow them to make decisions as well. And if you sometimes they could make, you know, if let's say the decision wasn't very great, you can actually role play with them. And I think this is where most parents struggle because they don't like to hear what their children response sometimes, <laughs> right? And sometimes um, they also feel like I'm not willing to release the control. <laughs> and there's a struggle within the parents, you know. And But after I actually do this, all I can say is the more control I give away, the more power I get back. And this is a bit <laughs> fascinating as well. Yes, I, 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 I agree with that. We do need to give our children more autonomy, more control, with supervision, of course, and with education in place right? We want to emphasize that part, not just control power over their devices and like a hands-free neglectful parenting, just the opposite. Uh, I, I also like the idea involving the child in the process since it's their life, it's their device. It's a co-creation, right? If we're creating rules and agreements with our children based in our family values, we need to involve our children. But how do you help parents define their core values? Well, uh, I can actually say that I realize this is, um, you know, like you have to, you know, I can actually run through the process, but I want to share, you know, how I actually discovered this. I actually discovered this during, uh, actually one of my friends passed away in March 2019. And she was quite close to me, to be honest. And uh, she's one of the very kind girls. And back when I was in high school, and back in high school, to be honest, I'm a very shy guy, shy girl. I'm very extremely introvert and I don't really talk much. And she's one of the girls that is willing to engage with me, talk to me. And she's a very dear friend of mine. So when she passed away, that time and three years prior to that, actually she had the nose cancer. And at the same time, she actually um, discovered that her, her unfaithful event of her spouse, which led to the divorce. And I guess that during that particular three years, she was very, pain, it's a very painful journey for her because she has to go through the nose cancer treatment at the same time, take back the custody, go through the divorce and, you know, take the custody of the boys. And, Actually, we, we didn't expect uh, her pass away as well, to be honest. We didn't expect because when she posts on the social media, she keep updating us on the social media. She was saying that everything is fine. The treatment is good, you know. So we kind of didn't expect that she will pass away, you know, in a way. So when I attend her funeral, you know, I will say that this is the one of the most beautiful funeral that I've actually attended. And during the funeral wake up service, her friend actually came up and actually said that, you know, tell, you know, the, the, the journey she went through. And she has actually forgiven her ex-husband who actually bring so much pain to her. And she actually embraced Christianity. And she was actually lived in a peace, you know, she was not really suffering and she just lived in peace with peace of mind as well. And what astonished me is when his son, his 12-year-old son came and actually spoke during the backup service. He was so calm and he's trying to make his mom proud. And all of my friends, including me, we were shocked. We thought that most likely a 12-year-old son would just cry and just talk, talk. But he didn't cry. He just tried to be tough. But at the same time, he's trying to make his mom proud. And he actually said, and along the lines, I remember what his mom actually teach him is about. Uh, you know, my mom teach me about courage, forgiveness, and love for the family. So there are a few things that when that event happened, I reflect back a lot on my life as well. 
I realized that I couldn't be there, even I wish to, just like my friends, right? So, and then I, I just realized that my friend did a so much good job, you know, even that her life is actually a bit short, you know, for her, his boy's journey. But she was able to teach him a good values, you know, about courage, forgiveness. So when I come back and I really reflect, because it's that time, that particular year is also somehow, I wasn't very happy. I was actually doing well in my career, but I wasn't very happy. You know, financially, I'm okay. But I just feel that something is not right. You know, I'm not happy. I'm not sure why. And I really look back into my life. What do I want? And that's where I think I, I start my personal development journey. And that's where the transformation really happens back in 2019. So one of the things that I want to work is on my parenting journey as well. Because I know that back then, I wasn't a good mom. And to be honest, I was like a monster mom, you know. I, I can actually share that some of the things I did to my child. I wasn't having a very good relationship with my eldest because I think that time she was like about eight, nine. You know, I, I, I think that point that she wasn't really engaged with me. So it gets me to reflect back what kind of the qualities that, you know, if my, few, my children, when they grow up, what are the qualities that they have? So I actually reverse engineer as in, I think about the end goal. And then in order to raise this kind of children, what are the family values I need so that I can actually bring them back to there, right? So it's actually come back to the fundamental of parenting. If I want, I know that, you know, some of the core values, which is very important, especially for me right now, responsibility, you know, able to, able to take ownership of your own things, able to take ownership of what you have, you have done good or even done wrong, right? So I think when they are able to own that and when they are elder, older, you know, I'm, I'm sure they will be doing okay, you know, in their life, you know, I will not need to be worried about, oh, how she's doing in his life, is it okay or not? I will not need to do that because I know these qualities will propel them in the long run. And that's where the, I started the journey. And sometimes uh, if you look back in the family values, it's also about your own childhood. You know, what are the things happen in your childhood that you will feel that this is very valuable to you? So in one of the conversation in my, with my student, when she come up with the family values, she didn't put peaceful as the family value, you know? But as I go through the coaching program with her and I discover that she couldn't really enforce, you know, the rules and we really dive deep and really do go through the coaching. And you know what? I realized that because of her childhood, there are so many conflicts in your childhood. Peace is one of the highest quality that she wants to maintain. And then I told her that, you know what? This is the most important family values in your family values because this is so important to you and you are fighting for it, right? It's also something that is very dear to you, you know? It could be something happened during your whole life and you feel that this is very important. It could be something happened during your childhood. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that moving story. Very, very touching. And... It's, it's, a, it's a great story that illustrates your point, you know, that it, it's all about the values. It's not about the control in the moment that we get with our kids. It's, you know, we want to think about the long term. We want to think about the future. What relationships do we want to have with our children? And, and sometimes, you know, in the thick of parenting, you lose sight of that larger picture of parenting. And I do also start with my clients with values. I, I think it's important. It reorients you in life, in career decisions. And it's especially important in parenting because there are so many trends, there are so many influences, so much information out there that can cloud our thinking, get in the way of our parenting. But at the core, you need to know who you are, what you stand for, what your values are. So you can protect those values and pass down those values to your children and what's important for your family and not what's working for the other family. Or yesterday, somebody called me and he asks me, I have four children, two teenagers and two preschoolers. I said, what's the reason you, know, you want to work with me? He says, oh, I just need a few parenting tips. 
I said, just like that, a few parenting tips, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's like, yes, I'm yelling at my kids. I'm not spanking them. I don't want to use corporal punishment, but I, I need a few parenting tips. I said, listen, it doesn't start with a few parenting tips, a few parenting tips. It's not going to help you. This is serious, deep work. We go into your values. We go into your parenting goals. It's not about tips at all. I don't even give tips to parents. It's about your principles. It's about who you are and how you live your life. It's about building that relationship with your kids. Tips is not going to help. If your car, for example, is needs major repair, you don't bring your car to a mechanic and say, can you give me a few safety tips? <laughs> you need major repair. If you have a toothache, if you have if you need root canal, if you have cavities, you don't go to a dentist and say, I need a few hygiene tips, right? <sighs> this is serious work. When it comes to parenting, many parents downplay it, minimize it, and they just want a few parenting tips as if they want to like fold their arms and say, oh, I, I give up. I don't know what to do. Tips is not going to help. So this is deep work, serious work if we want to cultivate a good relationship that is built on trust, not only in terms of parenting or digital parenting, but parenting in general. And I love that you start with values because that's where I start too. I just don't give out a few parenting tips. This is not that type of a business. <laughs> so how many values do you distill to? Because there are many, do you work with five core values, 10, or it doesn't matter? Um, I, I want to go a little granular here. Sure, sure. Uh, to be honest, you know what? Uh, the most difficult part is not on our children, you know? I always say the most difficult part is on ourselves. Because when you actually put out the values, you are the role model. <laughs> so I always, I always teach my students and I say, maybe start with three, something that you can follow easily. You don't want to overwhelm yourself when you put 10. Yes, it's good. But you realize that you couldn't caught up and you, you can't actually hold that value. I think it's even more, you know, you have to actually go back, you know. So I always start my, my students with maybe three to six maximum. And then from there, and once they are able, they are comfortable, they are able to hold the values, then you can actually stack on. And is control on that list sometimes? <laughs> No, no, no. It's always not about control. To be honest, if let's say the parents came to my sales call and actually they say, oh, I want to be controlled. Then I say, oh, sorry, I'm not your parenting coach. It was sometimes I, 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 I get that kind of calls too. How can, I'm like, what's the reason for your call? And then this person will say, I want to control my seven-year-old better. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get two types of people who just want a few parenting tips and who want to control their children better. It's not about that. So um, I, I like that three to six values. And it's not just selecting values. You do a little deep work to uncover those values. But I want to go back to what you said before about giving our children decision-making opportunities. And of course, they're going to fail and make mistakes. And that's how they're going to learn. How else are you going to learn decision-making, right? Um, but what you said about ownership of their own thing, that's huge, right? Here we are, we give them a device. That's their own thing. But then we take away the rest of the ownership that has to come with that device because we control everything. And you know what I mean? So we undermine exactly that. I think getting clear on, on the values, what's important is huge, is huge. So what do you do next? Once you establish that somebody has three to six values, how do you move from there? Okay, so usually I will get them to, you know, establish an internet safety habits agreement. And then I'll actually teach them about the, you know, the quick hacks about the internet safety, what are habits you should look for, and all these are the signs that, you know, there's problem. And then after that, you actually come up with internet safety agreement. But you know what? I'll always tie back internet safety habits agreement back to the values. Because I want to have the why. 
And I want to have the strong why for the children to see why they should actually uphold the Internet Safety Habits Agreement as well. Because when it comes to value, yes, we want values. But at the same time, you know, we, we are not like giving everything to the children. They can make decisions as they like, you know. There are still limits and there are still boundaries. And they have to do that, you know. And even for us, we still have our own limits and boundaries, you know. You can't just like, you know, because I'm adult, I can just drive 150 or 160 kilometers per hour in the highway, right? Because we are still bounced by the law of, you know, your... You know the you know in your in your in your country you know like if let's say this highway is only 110 it's only mixed to 110 you cannot just drive 150 as you like right so even adults we are also bounced by limits and boundaries and we have to actually teach them about limits and boundaries and why is it important to have the limits and boundaries right so then we tie back to the the internet safety to the limits and boundaries and also the family values so that they can see the why they should follow. Why? And you should, you when they see that it's actually their own values and they agree to the rules, the chances are they are most likely to follow through. I like how you use the term internet safety agreement as opposed to contract, screen time contract or something like that, which is kind of derogatory and demeaning for the child. But here you highlight internet safety agreement, which in reality, it is about safety, right? It's not about my mom is controlling me. You don't want your child to take away from this agreement that, oh, my mom is just trying to control me in a nicer way, is pretending to create a contract or an agreement. But if it, I don't want this to be a masked opportunity, you know, because children sense the inauthenticity in all of that. I like that you name it Internet Safety Agreement. I have an agreement with my daughter and I we did co-create together and it was not easy, I have to say. It was hard because it was uncomfortable for me to even to listen to her, what she wanted, how much she wanted, why she wanted. She made a whole list of arguments, but I know it, it, it was on me. I had the discomfort in me of losing control, maybe, or not knowing the terrain or the territory, what this is going to be. Oh my gosh the uncertainty, what am I doing as a parent, the not knowing, the uncertainty, the losing of control, or not trusting that you may navigate this well, I think gets in the way for the parent. But once you relinquish that, silence that voice and sit down with your child and just simply listen, I think, is, is a good place. And children are very reasonable. They're not unreasonable. They, they never say, I want to use the screens from 8 a.m. To, to 12. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they don't say that. But when parents use a lot of control, they sort of go against them. Uh, do you find that that's the case? When you engage yeah. the children, actually, you get a lot more rules put in place. Children are more cooperative when they are engaged and their opinion is considered. Yes, yes, I, I do relate to that, you know, like, um, you know, when we started and I was asking, you know, do you, how much do you think you want to have like this particular access to this uh, uh, video series? Because she was actually telling me she like this video series is actually from China. It's more like a jokes. And I saw that I, I think, okay, it's fine. It's, no, it's not like, and we even discussed, you know, do you have foul language? And she said, no, even that's foul language is always stood. And she tell me, you know, why she thinks that this is funny for her. And, and after that, I asked, how much time do you want then? Then she was telling me, 30 minutes. Then I was like, okay, okay, 30 minutes. Okay, fine. And I was like, so shocked, you know, because I was thought like, wow, she was, in the beginning, I was thought maybe she would be asking for one, two hours. But when she tell me that it's 30 minutes, I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> right? So, so, and so, so, yes. I can, I, can, I can relate to that because when my daughter had her phone, when we gave her a phone, uh, we said that it comes with responsibilities and we wanted to have that discussion. Uh, so she wanted TikTok, you know, this app TikTok, right? And it was very popular at the time, uh, two years ago, and she just wanted to do this TikTok dance and, and whatever they do. I said, fine. 
Yes, you can have TikTok. And how much time do you think you're going to use daily? And she said 20 minutes. And I was shocked too. I thought, you know, I thought she's going to be on it the whole day, right? No, she said 20 minutes. And guess what? I gave that 20 minutes to her. I regulate her screen time limits from my phone because we have iPhones, right? Mm. So we set up screen time limits for her, 20 minutes for TikTok, I think 15 minutes on Snapchat or maybe 25. And then recently she got rid of TikTok altogether because she said, mom, it's just a waste of time. I hate TikTok because she learned on her own that this is stupid. I'm not going to waste my time on this. And, and so it's like, if I were to be opposed to TikTok, like from the beginning and have power struggles, she would have never discovered or come to understand this on her own, which I think is very important, right? And, and so I think parents have a lot of fears that sometimes are just that fears unfounded in reality. And like you said, it begins with the parent. Can you examine where you're stuck, what your fears are. Can you talk to someone like Jesse, like myself, people who work with real parents? I think this is the power of coaching is, is really important here because on your own, parents are lost and confused and they resort to their own old methods because the fear drives them very, very much so. And so how big is this agreement that you create with children? How many points that it has? Or is it specific to each family? It's actually specific to each family. But obviously, I, you know, if you ask me, then I will always assess, you know, things that they have access. So um, at the moment, to be honest, uh, my children don't have an access to the social media because, you know, social media is actually 13 and above. And my younger eldest is only 11 years old. And she didn't ask for social media so far. So, you know, so, um, so, but of course, uh, it depends on what are the things that you have allowed access. So I would say that depends on the access they have and the, you know, the exposure they have, then you actually customize the internet safety habits agreement to, to whatever you have, you know, but obviously if let's say they have access to the, you know, the social media, then maybe there will be more things. It's more on like the education, ed education things, you know, like, you know, um, uh, be aware of challenge uh, because in social media, there are a lot of people actually post about this challenge, you know, challenge people to do something. And sometimes it could be fatal, you know, some people actually do it and actually, you know, and it becomes just dangerous for the kids, you know. So you have to be aware and actually know what the challenge is about and, you know, allow them to really think, you know, think objectively, is this in line with my family values? Does it create some physical danger to myself, you know, because some, some day challenges will actually allow you to have some physical danger or even to do with the electricity, you know, some that actually put something in the electricity and you just burn almost the house down, you know. So you have to be aware of that and, you know, more on the education, but you can actually start as a simple as, you know, like maybe a few lines. I think maybe five to six lines will do. Yes. There are some challenges that are very dangerous, um, right? There was one about suicide uh, a few years back, I remember. And there was one recently, my daughter's school district sent us an email about that. There's a challenge to vandalize the school bathrooms. Please be aware, talk to your children about that challenge and, and let's prevent that. So what you're saying is parents have to have open, honest conversations. You don't want to snoop on your children but you want to have open conversations to know what's going on in their online world, right? What, what are they doing? I think I can't emphasize this part enough, right? Because a device is this digital device that is um, mobile. You know, you take your phone with you everywhere and you can do whatever you want. And so parents obviously don't know what the child is doing and you can only conjure like negative things, but it's not always negative things that children are involved in for sure. But establishing the open conversations is key to getting access to their world to, and, and the child will show you, will share with you. will say, mom, let's make a TikTok together. If there is an invitation from the child, I think parents should, should definitely 
take upon and, and participate because that's a connection, a connection point instead of saying, no, I'm not interested. If your child knows that you're there only for the control purposes and not just curiosity, interest, your interest in is not genuine, then it's going to block the communication. I was recently, uh, my daughter was on the phone with someone, uh, with her friend, a boy, and um, I went into the room and she was FaceTiming with this boy. And she said, mom, say hello to such and such. And I came on the phone. I said, when my daughter invites me, of course, I want to participate, right? Because that's her world. Uh, She says, mom, say hello to my friend, such and such. And I say, hi, hi, such and such. How are you doing today? And for whatever reason, I don't know what happened. My daughter used the word, the F word, while we were speaking, the three of us. And, and this boy said, oh, you curse in front of your mom. And, and my daughter looked at me and she, she, she blushed. And I said, yeah, you, you don't curse in front of your parents. And, and he said, no. I said, what would happen if you curse? And, and he said, I don't know, but I've never done it. See, family values, very different, but it's also learning experience. Then we had a conversation about this, me and my daughter, about rules, about cursing, about parent-child relationships, you know, what it's like in other families. I think it's good to have access to their world, but it's not by force we have to enter, it's by invitation and by not burning the little bridges that they create Yes, yes. Actually, I think uh, the most important is about the open conversation because I felt that, um, you know, like, you know, anything happened, uh, you know, my child will, can always come to me and tell me the truth. And I think this is very important, you know, because you know what, um, at the end of the day, you know, we do make mistakes. You know, we cannot expect that children don't make mistakes, you know, it's actually not accept, you know, because we also do mistakes even at our age, even that we are, they have so much of experience in life. So, you know, it's about the safe space that they can actually come and actually talk to you, you know. Not about, not all about good things. It's also about the bad things. And you know what? The most of the time, I think the child find the most distressing moment is they have to come to their parents and say, mom, well, you know what? I have to tell you something. <laughs> I've done this, 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 you know, and, and it's actually take a lot of courage and uncomfortableness in them to reveal that what they've actually happened, you know. So I think it's also about creating the safe space and, you know, knowing, allowing your children to know that you are always be there regardless of what they've done. You know, I think this is very important and therefore they will actually come to you. And sometimes I, as I'm also a cybersecurity expert, so we know that what are the things that we can actually look and we we'll know what are the things that we can see. <clears throat> to be honest, some of it, you don't need expensive parental control because uh, anything on the computer is, is traceable. We can obviously go back, you know, in the computer, what are the things you have done? We can easily access on that. What are the things that you have browsed and all that? So we do have access to that. And sometimes I will just tell my parents, maybe you start in the beginning and see. And after, you know, after going through, you know, the, the, the things that they have actually searched, what are the space that they go, it's nothing interesting, you know. But I, you know? Know, I know some kids who erase the history and their parents have a hard time with that. You know, children also are tech savvy, so they can, they can erase their traces, right? So that to me talks about the distrust that was already there overall in parenting, whether we're talking about digital parenting or parenting in general, I think it comes down to how you parented your children before they had access to internet or or screens. You know, were you judgmental and controlling? You know, did they have that safe space always? It's not like you had open conversations and nice space and your relationship was amazing. Now you gave them devices and it's the complete opposite. You know what I mean? The digital devices, digital parenting highlights the areas where we failed or where we had shortcomings. I, I think digital parenting highlights what we didn't see before in, in our parenting. Do you agree with that? 
Well, well to in 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 to be honest, in the digital era, you know, in everything, you know, like Google actually have access to what we are searching, you know, and it's just matter whether you log or not. And you know, when it comes to the cyber world, everything is can be traceable. You know, because I was working in corporate world before and we want to trace on certain other things that you have access, we can easily trace. And anything on the computer itself is actually traceable, including I would say that Google knows exactly where I go from point A to point B to point C on the internet. So everything is actually a digital footprint and you have to be aware of your digital footprint. Whether you lock or don't lock, the digital footprint is already there. It's just that whether do you lock it to you want to see yourself or not so that you know what you are doing. And when you come to the, come to the you know, the children actually erase the, the, the locks, it's also about comes back to the family values. Like if let's say you want to have access to this, you are curious about, why don't you just let me know so that we can actually explore it together rather than you try to do hanky-panky things, you know, and obviously, you know, as, as a, and I, because I came from a cyber security background where I started as, you know, helping organizations to test their system, meaning that I tried to pen test and do the hacking part. So I know how to bypass control. And to be honest, even I installed the parental control, I can immediately see what are the things I want to bypass if I choose to, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean, right? So I know that there are a lot of things that you can bypass. It's just depend on how desperate you are, <laughs> how desperate and how, how you want to go that far, you know. So I think that at, at, the, so at the end of the day, it's also come next to your family values, you know. We want transparency, you know. I, when I talk to my children, you know, you, we want to be like really transparent to each other. What do you like about things like about things that, and I told her that everything is traceable. I just be honest with her. And even my digital footprint is being locked by Google. Google knows exactly what I'm actually doing on the internet. Facebook also do. You know, who do I message? Who do I talk to? You know, and Zoom also have conversations in there. And if you record this, if you record in the cloud, they also have a conversation. You know, our conversations being recorded. All of these are digital footprint. And you have to educate about our children so about the digital footprint. Because you know what? If they are not <coughs> aware of their digital footprint, they may just do stupid stuff which damage their digital footprint. And you know what? Nowadays, HR, the human resource, and the headhunters, they will actually go through your digital footprint, your social media. They will go through your LinkedIn, <clears throat> not just LinkedIn, because LinkedIn usually look professional. They go through your Facebook, your TikTok, your Instagram, and they will see what kind of person you are. And if let's say you're always a, very, a person who is very narcissistic, always you know, um, complain or always, you know, leave a, you know, a trolls, always leave, try to bully someone on the internet, right? So when I'm, if let's say I'm the HR, I'll see, oh my God, this girl has problems. I don't want her to be on my firm, right? So you have to be aware of your digital footprints. And it's just astonished me that so many people are not aware about their digital footprints. They just post as what they like, you know? And sometimes it's actually very damaging you know, for your own image. And, you know, um, it's, it's not like a place that, oh, now I can voice freely. I disagree that, in fact, I feel that in the physical world with no cameras, you have even more freedom and privacy rather than anything on the internet because anything that has done is done. It's already there. You cannot undo. Anything that you have posted, it's already posted. You don't tell me that I delete it. You know, Facebook still have it someone may just screenshot it and, you know, someone will just post it somewhere. We don't know because, you know, all this content can be, you know, reorganized. So it's also about educating the children and the logs is there. It's just to make sure that, you know, sometimes we just want to know what are the things that they are searching, you know, and sometimes what are the controls that have actually bypassed? You know, sometimes they are not bypassing that, you know, sometimes I'm just like very curious. I see that, oh, she has actually done this. I'm not sure how she did it. Then I was just asking curious, Sven, can you show me how do you do this? I'm just be curious, you know, just ask. And then say, okay, this is how I do. Da, 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 da. Then I say, oh, okay, okay. And then I will actually show, you know, is this the right way or this is not the right way? You know, like, because I'm also very concerned about the content that you expose. Because if you are, if you don't 
turn on the safe surfing, you know, you may, when you search, you may come across those adult content that is not suitable for you. And also be transparent her, her, you know, some of the contents are not suitable for you, adult contents. And, you know, you ask them, do you want this to see it? And sometimes they will actually say that, yeah, actually, I don't want to see it as well, right? So it's, and the log is there just to give you a peace of mind. But if you ask me whether I check it all the time, no, I don't check it all the time. Maybe from time to time, because the software will send an email to me. So I maybe check once, once a month. And usually the things I check is the sites they go, what are the things that you watch, anything that is, is not. And we discuss about the content a lot because, you know, like I said, the content that exposed many, many times will just normalize the behavior that is not in line with your family values. And you have to be very careful about the social media diet, you know, are they exposed, right? What are they actually listening to? So you have to be very careful about the, the content that exposed. And I think it's, Having the family meeting really be transparent with each other is the best thing because they will actually tell you what they went through. And sometimes they will actually say, I think this is right. Um, this is the right content because it teach me. And they will actually justify for you as well because they know the family values well. So what you're also saying is, is the parents also need that safety education because many parents themselves may not be aware of, of the dangers of their digital footprint. I, I think it's important information for the parents as well. And then they can educate their, their children about it. Because I, I think oftentimes parents resort to control because of lack of information, lack of knowledge, right? If they knew how to have those difficult conversations, how to discuss about the content, they perhaps wouldn't resort, resort to control because control is easy. You control and you think it's not, your child is not going to be exposed to anything, but you also are not aware, both of you, of, of the real dangers or the footprint. Uh, I, I think it's, it's important conversation. Do you have anything that the parents can download or you can give it to my listeners, like a PDF about how to have those internet safety conversations or how to draw the internet safety agreement. I'm wondering what useful thing you may have for my listeners. Yes, yes. Uh, I have this um, called uh, dangerous apps in your child's smartphone uh, because I was actually looking for that. Uh, and then I find that there are a lot of hanky panky. Uh, and you're right, actually, to be honest, I think I'll, because maybe I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a tech lady, so I know what is happening. So I'm actually very, I know what to do. But, you know, there are a lot of apps that you find interesting, like uh, there's a calculator app, which is not a calculator. But, you know, if you click on it, it looks like a calculator. But if you put out the specific number, which is the pin, you will unlock. And that is where your child will, uh, you know, hide the things that they do not want you to see. It's actually a hiding app, not a calculator app, you know. So, and I compiled a bunch of like the apps that you, you know, you should aware of the dangers out there. Uh, it's actually at the, uh, my website, which um, is a bit long. Maybe I, was, I have to send to you later um, the, the website. So there's an app. All you need is just name, put your name and email address. You can actually download it. Download it. And I have this uh, video training about six strategies in digital parenting your children, which is located, uh, I post it on my Facebook group, which is the digital parenting, reduce screen addiction and inappropriate content. And you can just ask to join the Facebook group, it's free. And then you can actually build the resources. I posted some of the contents like, you know, six strategies to digital parenting your children and how to navigate screens as well. And uh, we also teach why you should digital parenting right now. And some of the yeah. other resources as well. Yeah, that, that's, that sounds great. I will have links to all of those in, in the show notes page of, of, this, uh, of this episode. So what do you recommend? Shall parents follow their children on social media? Is it a good practice, not a good practice? Or it depends. Uh, shall parents have access... Should parents have their child's passport to the phone? Yay or nay? Where do, where do you stand? Or, or it depends. 
I would say it depends. Um, you know, as if you if you ask me, I think at the when they are older, maybe like 15, 16 years old, we should relinquish more controls to them. Because you know what? You know, if you are, I, I think if let's say we look into control length, right? We can only control up to certain years, you know, like maybe by 18 years old, then they will tell you, oh, mama, I'm big, you know, stop controlling me, right? Then they're just feeling like, oh, it's time to escape, right? So, so, and then that's where, that's where, you know, people, you know, and then these young youth people, they will just, you know, indulge in the social media because in the past they are not allowed to and suddenly they have and they become very addicted to it as well. And maybe they just exposed to the internet dangers because there is no education about the internet dangers out there as well. So I would say that, you know, when they are getting older, you, we should relinquish the control back to them. You know, instead of having the past of their social media, maybe it's time to friend them. You know, as long as I think you have the environment and you know that the trust is there and your children know that, you know, uh, because you have the children also know, need to know the, that once the trust is there, any point of a life will just kill the trust, you know. So it's also a things that you have to allow your children to know that what are the things that will kill the trust, you know. And you want to maintain that particular transparent and open conversations so that your child will actually discuss with you and maybe, you know, when they are 15, 16, it's better to follow them on the social media. I will recommend at least follow their social media so you are know you know what they are up to. Yeah. And able to engage in their online journey. Well, they can they can create another social media. They they can create another Instagram just for themselves and fool the parent, they, right? If there is no trust that the child can create a main one where the parent follows them and another one where the parent doesn't follow them. So they, they can always bypass that. But what it comes down to is building trust, having open conversations, being curious, being available for our children and relinquishing control. Instead of control, engaging children in the process of discipline, in the process of co-creating agreements and making agreements based on your family values. And making agreements doesn't mean it's set in stone, right? You can make an agreement, but that agreement may not be practical or may not work. So it's also important to mention that you can revisit and change as your children grow older, as your interests change, as your lifestyle changes. And so this digital world is a constant evolving sphere. So we also have to go with it. We have to be up to date, right? And keep up with it. So that, that's that's the main message that I'm I'm hearing from today's conversation. What are your final thoughts or tips, if you will, um, before we say goodbye? How do you want to end this conversation? What do you want the listener to take away? I think it's about like the trust because uh, as you spoke about it, I realized that you know how do I find that I have the trust level in my daughter? So. Um, so we have this conversation, I just recall back, so I just thought to maybe I want to share as well. You know, like um, uh, I'm in Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia usually are very academic driven. You know, most of the schools are very academic driven. And then I was actually, um, my second son, he just went to the school back last year because that time we still have schools open. So he was actually telling me, you know what, the principal asked you not to throw the water on the school. You know, and she couldn't understand why. And I was sitting together with my, I was driving, my daughter and my son is there. And actually my daughter actually said, you know what? The boys and the girls, they will actually throw the water because when they bring the water bottle, go back home, it's full, they will get scold. So what they do is they throw the water away, right? So yeah. we couldn't think of like this kind of small, small things, you know, that I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Then I was looking at my, my daughter and us, how come your water is always not full, but at least it's still not, not empty, you know? How come you didn't throw your water? I don't find there's a need to. <laughs> right? Right? Yes. And, and she even shared about like, you know, oh, there's a lot of other things as well. And sometimes, you know, you, you don't think that they also learn from their peers, you know? And she told me that, you know what? I have even friends, she will actually use the liquid paper and actually try to 
erase the bad marks, you know, and they will try to make the marks as good as possible, you know, because you know what, when they go home, if the marks are bad, they will got scope. And my daughter will never do that if she got a very bad grade, you know, or bad score on the paper. You know, she will just come to me and obviously in the beginning, she will say, oh, mom, I have something to tell you. Um, um, you know, I'm not sure, but um, then I say, tell la." Then she'll say, okay, I got these marks, you know, I think I've learned a lot of mistakes. And she'll actually justify why she actually made a lot of mistakes. And, and I say, okay, so you know your mistakes, you know, you really, re you really reflect why you're doing badly in your score. And I'm happy with that, you know, just make sure that you don't repeat it in your next, next thing, you know. So it's about, you know, the, the, account, the ownership of, you know, the children, they're able to, you know, bring that particular thing and talk to you, even though, you know, Having a bad mark is usually not something that is welcome by parents, usually. And then they are still able to tell you. And they are also able to reflect what, what went wrong. I think this is very important about how do you teach your children how to think. And that's come back to the family values. I hope this really summarized to what we have actually talked about. Like, you know, the trust, you know, the conversations and all that. <laughs> Yes, it, it did. It, it indeed it did. And um, I'm sorry for the listener who was waiting for quick parenting tips uh, and we didn't hand out any tips today. <sighs> but, but, but it's I think it begins with conversations like this and we can never cover this topic enough. A parents always going to have questions about screen time and screen limits. It's an ever evolving subject. And the research on this area is not conclusive. They don't have long-term research, right? Uh, so it also contributes to parental anxiety and it yields to control and parents have lots of fears um, because let's face it, this is all new. It's still new, right? And, and we don't know, you know what's going on, what's going to happen. So I want to thank you today, Jesse, for joining me from South Asia. We have a big time difference. Thank you. We'll stay connected and I will have links to all those resources that you mentioned in the show notes. Thank you so much for inviting here. And I hope um, this can actually give a lot of insights and a lot of tips to you know, the parents out there in digital parenting their children. That concludes today's conversation, my dear listener, and I hope you enjoyed it. What's your biggest takeaway? What are the struggles in your own household around screen time? Do you have an agreement with your kids? Have you ever tried creating one? Let's continue this conversation. It's an important one in our private Facebook community. If you want to reach out privately, you can send me a note to the email info at authenticparenting.com. You can call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. And lastly, you can use the SpeakPipe tool on the contact page of my website, authenticparenting.com forward slash contact. As I mentioned earlier, the 300th episode of the podcast is approaching really fast and I need your audio messages by November 19th. So get to it. If you enjoy the podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or by becoming a patron. With a small monthly contribution, as small as $2 a month, you can support your favorite show and get supporter-only benefits and content. In fact, Jesse Liu has provided a PDF for families. It's called Six Strategies for Digital Parenting, and I am going to share that with my Patreon community. To learn more, Go to patreon.com forward slash authentic parenting or simply click the link in your show notes. You can find the show or follow it wherever podcasts are played, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. And you can connect with me on Instagram, the only social media platform that I use 
and somewhat enjoy. Until next week, connect to the present moment, to yourself and your children. I am Anna Seewald. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.